So enunciators mean it makes a sound. You hear it. Okay. Final control element means it might actually do something as a result of the alarm. Like high pressure, maybe just open a valve and vent. Okay. But you always have these alarms going off so people know, because there's too much information to see on the screen. So the idea of the alarm is to draw immediate attention to what the problem actually is. Okay. All right, so here is uh, an arrangement where you have um, a sensor that is shared between f control and, and alarming. So this is just a simple flow controller. You, this is the most common controller in the world. Okay. You measure the flow. You compare it to desired flow, you manipulate a valve. These kind of controllers are ever in a plant, literally hundreds of them. Okay, so this sensor could not only provide the signal to the controller, but could also signal an alarm if this flow, for example, gets too high or too low, so that operators might do something. <laughs> if you thought this was a really critical measurement for alarming and safety, you might actually allocate a separate sensor for this particular purpose so that you can assure that it'll continue to work. Um, so these, these things are called interlocks. So the way the control works is that if you see the level is too high, you have kind of a graded response to reduce the level over a period of time. If the, the problem you're observing is really potentially catastrophic, you, you want to compensate immediately for this, okay? So for example, in this case, let's say you have a tank and the, and the pressure gets too high, like it gets beyond a critical limit. It's not. So you might think there's a set point that you want to operate at, the pressure. Okay, so here's the pressure, right? And then you have some desired set point, and that's where you'd like to operate, but then you have some high pressure. If it gets above that, it's a, it's a real problem. Okay, at that point, you usually bypass the control system and simply vent like this. I mean, this isn't the normal way you would like to control pressure in a, in a drum, is to vent to the atmosphere, okay? So there's a different way you want to control pressure, but if the pressure gets beyond a certain limit, you'll just immediately vent, it'll reduce the pressure really quickly. It's not desirable, because usually when you vent, you flare. You know what flare means? Like, there'll be, fi there'll be a fire coming out of the top of, and people see that. Like, people that live in the neighborhood see that, and it's often they want, news crews will go out to a plant and say, why were you flaring from 2 to 3 o'clock on the ethylene unit today? And so it's <laughs> actually something you don't want to do. So this is just if, if you have a big problem, you have to compensate for it quickly. And then you could have the same thing with flow here, right? So if this level gets critically high in this tank, then you have like a solenoid. That's just an on-off thing. It just turns this pump on and starts pumping. Okay, so it's not, it's not for regular routine control, it's just for safety purposes. <laughs> hey, we finished that, that's awesome. All right. All right, so I think I told you that in this class, we'll have different lectures. Some lectures will be kind of high, that was pretty high level, right? There was almost no, there was no equations in, that, in the lecture I just gave. Just to give you some idea of the flavor and practice of control. Because I don't want you leaving the class thinking all there is to control is Laplace transforms, because that's not how it works in industry. But I also don't want you to leave the class thinking there's no mathematics behind control either. So I'm trying to strike an appropriate blend. We'll see if I accomplish that. So now this is a more analytical part of the material I'm going to cover. Um, this is, uh, I think, I can tell you this is not on the exam. Now everyone leaves, right? But just so you don't worry, because I'm not going to be able to give you a homework problem on this, and it, is, it will look a little bit complicated. It'll take you some time to get familiar with it. Um, I don't want you to think like this is a key concept for the exam. Okay? I'll talk about the exam tomorrow. But. All right, so something called a closed-loop transfer function. So, okay, I hope you're familiar with this. Right. So we know how to do this, I hope. This is, this is, so what do we do? We have a set of differential equations. We linearize them if necessary. We take Laplace transform. We rearrange them, these algebraic equations you get when you take Laplace transform. And we find the relationship between the input u, manipulate input u, and the output y. And that thing we call g. Okay. This is what I'll call the open loop transfer function. It's the transfer function that represents the dynamics of the process. Okay. Now, 
This is if there's no control, right? Because we, we did this without even talking about control. If we have control, we're going to get a different type of thing here, which I'm about to explain to you. This different thing is going to be called the closed loop transfer function. <coughs> and the point of this lecture is to try to explain to you what that is and how you get it. OK? Um, so to start, I will give the classic stirred tank heating example they love in the book as kind of a motivating example. I will take this example, represent the whole system um, in a schematic. I will take that schematic, I'll transfer it into a block diagram. Block diagram means how do the different pieces fit together, like here's the controller, here's the valve, here's the process, here's the sensor, so on and so forth. And from that block diagram, I'll derive the thing that I want, which is this closed loop transfer function. At the end, I'll quickly go through this um, example from Simulink. All right. So this is the overview kind of slide about where we're going. Um, so we like these block diagrams. We like to work with block diagrams and control because they're a very convenient way to represent systems, closed loop systems. So by closed loop, I mean the process connected up to a controller for feedback control. Okay. And you've also noticed already, I think, that in Simulink, it's, it's a block diagram oriented environment. You take blocks, you c connect them up. And so this is a nice parallel between what we, what we do analytically in the class and what you can do in Simulink. Okay. All right. So a, um, let me see if I can, of course, this isn't connected, so it's not advancing. No surprise. Let me see if I can land a preemptive strike. There's a preemptive strike. See this picture here? This is what I mean by a closed loop system. So what is this particular system doing? Okay. So it's a stirred tank. Well, it's actually a blending system. So what do we have? We have two streams coming in here. One, this is the mass flow rate, and let's say mass fraction of one of the components, binary mixture. This is another mixture. And the idea here is that we have no control over this stream, but we can, we can manipulate the flow of this particular stream. And the goal is to mix these two streams together so that we get some desired composition coming out. Just mixing two streams to get a, a desired mass fraction. Okay. So to do this, what are we going to do? Well, this is a well-mixed system. So the idea here is that we'll take a measurement of the composition of this material in here, have we do that sample in GC or whatever it might be. Take that signal, send it to a controller, compare that to the desired value of the mass fraction, generate a signal okay, that goes through this converter so the electrical signal can be driven, uh, converted to a signal that actually drives the valve, and that will manipulate the flow. Okay. So you might think this is a higher, you know, as a limiting case, you consider this to be, you know, this is the mass fraction of A. It's a mixture of A and B. This is pure A, just for simplicity. So obviously, if this gets depleted in A, the idea is to increase the amount of pure A fed in here so that you get the mass fraction you want. Okay, so it's not very complicated. So, so when we talk about the G, okay, meaning the process transfer function, I'm talking about how this flow okay, affects the composition in this. That's the G. Okay. The closed loop transfer function is going to involve the G, but it's also going to involve these other elements that weren't there until we talked about control, like the sensor, the controller, this converter, the valve, that, all that together with the process is what we call the closed loop system. So this is a closed loop system here. Okay? All right. Whoops. All right, so a transfer function is the, uh, in principle, is uh, the closed loop transfer function is a particular transfer function be between any two signals in the closed loop system. Usually we're only interested in this case here. Okay? So for a closed loop system, I'm, I'm going to go back. I don't know why I don't. Let me just connect this thing. I'm not sure why I don't do this. Maybe it's because it doesn't work. Oh, there we go. All right. So for a closed loop system, if you have no controller, the input is W2 and the output is X. That's the process, the open loop system. Okay. If we have a control system, okay you can see that this W2 is no longer directly manipulable. or I say it is adjusted by something else, which is the controller. And now what we can choose is the set point. See, so if you don't have a controller, you choose the flow. If you have a controller, you choose the set point that you want for this composition, and the controller will choose what the flow should be. Okay. So this thing is now the input instead of this thing. 
And then we also might have disturbance input. So for example, we might be concerned that the flow of this stream we have no control over might change. So that means the inputs in that case would be our desired value of the composition and then this disturbance. Okay? The output would still remain the thing we're interested in, which is the um, value of this mass fraction. Okay, and that's what this statement says. The inputs are usually the set point that we want to achieve or some external disturbance that we would like to eliminate its effect. Okay? And the output is still the thing you'd like to actually control. In this case, it's the mass fraction. Okay? It's convenient, as I'll show you, to represent these things um, in block diagram f uh, format. And at the end of the class, I'll show you that you can actually derive these automatically in Simulink. And that these closed loop transfer functions form the basis of a lot of stuff that we do for the rest of the course. Okay? So the idea is that once you have this thing in hand, you can, you can work with it to understand how the system will behave. You can tune controllers. You can design controllers. So it's kind of a critical link to what we do. Um, so it's important you understand it. I don't think you'll completely understand it until you have a chance to do a homework, which is like in a week or two. And that's why I want to make sure you understand it's not on the test, because uh, you'll have trouble. I mean, you may understand it easily, but I don't want you to spend a lot of time studying that in lieu of the other stuff. All right, so we've already gone over this picture, right? So the control system consists of, well, you have the process itself, but you have, you have to have the sensor that provides the composition of measurement. You have to have the controller that operates on the, usually the difference between the set point and the desired value. Send a signal to the valve through this IDP converter. So this is the, these different elements of the control system we have to worry about, okay? So this is a dense slide, clearly. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come up with a block diagram representation of this particular system. So, so far we've done this. You may have a process and then we take the Laplace transform and do all the stuff that we enjoy doing and then eventually we can represent the system like this, right? Like the original system was in a set of differential equations, but we linearize, take a Laplace transform, rearrange, and eventually we get this block diagram. This tells us how the input U affects the output Y. It's just the process. This, this is nothing but the process here. No control. Okay. Now we want to do something similar, but now instead of doing it for just a process, we want to do it for the process with the control system connected to it. Okay. So in other words, we want to do it, sorry, wrong direction. Uh, we want to do it for this instead of just the process. It should be that if I told you that there, there was, we already did this, there was no controller here at all and you need to build a transfer function between this flow and this composition, you could do that. You'd write out the mass balances, you'd linearize and essay, take Laplace transforms. So we, that's really the focus of the first test as I'll talk about. But what we want to do now is something similar block diagram representation, but now it's going to include not only the transfer function for the process, but also transfer functions that represent these different elements. That's what we're trying to do, okay? So first thing is get the transfer function of the process. Because we've done this um, many times, or at least a lot of times, I'm going to take some liberties and do it very quickly. So this is the way classes work, right? You cover some material and then at some point, I assume you know how to do this, and I go over it quickly. Because if I, otherwise the problems just get unwieldy long, right? So if we wanted to build a model of this system, what we do, well, it's a mixing system, so we probably need mass balances, right? We don't need energy balances or momentum balances. So it's constant volume. So normally over here would be like, right, D rho V DT. But density is constant and volume is constant, so that means there's no accumulation of mass itself in the tank. That means the two flows out have to equal the flow, sorry, the sum of the two flows in have to equal the flow out. That's where that comes from, okay? This is a component balance, okay? Since you have a binary mixture and you have an overall mass balance, you just need to do a balance on one component. So I'll take whatever the X represents, component A, let's say. So this is the amount of A in the tank, right? Rho V is the mass. That's the mass fraction of A. So that's the mass of A in the tank. Tank, it's derivative. That's the accumulation of A in the tank. It's, it's the difference of the amount of A that flows in the two inlet streams minus the amount of A that goes out of the outlet stream, right? Just a simple mass balance. Now, to get this equation, 
what have I done? Well, I've obviously divided by rho v, because rho and v are constant. I can pull them out and divide by them. And then I've also eliminated w in terms of w1 and w2. So if you plug, if you recognize this thing is w1 plus w2, and then you divide by rho v, you'll get this. Okay? If you can't see it, it's, it's actually very simple. Okay? All right. Now this thing is a function of, so now what I'm doing is I'm telling you what this thing is going to be a function of that I care about. In other words, things that might change with time. It's a function of a lot of things. It's a function of rho. But um, rho's not changing. So I'm not going to indicate it's a function of rho. So clearly, x changes with time, right? You, otherwise, you wouldn't have a differential equation. Now I'm telling you this problem has two particular inputs. The inputs I'm interested in are the, the mass fraction of that one inlet stream and the flow of that inlet stream that I have no control over. Okay? Those are two inputs of interest to me. All right? Ah, sorry. I knew something was wrong when I said yeah, You ever do that? You know something's wrong when you're saying it, but you're like, I'm already committed to the sentence. I'm just going through with it. OK. <laughs> so let's, let's go. I, sorry, I have to go back to the picture. The inputs of interest are the composition of this stream, which I have no control over. That's a disturbance input. And obviously, given the picture I've drawn, I want, I'm interested in this input here because I want to use this for control. Okay. So disturbance input, x1, manipulated input, w2. Okay. So the reason I knew to say this function depended on these things is I know it depends on x because that's a dependent variable of differential equation. That's the output. I would have to tell you in the problem statement that the two inputs are x1 and w2. Okay. But I'm telling you that now. All right, so we look at this equation and we think, oh, let's take the Laplace transform of this. But then we say, oh, no, W2 multiplies x. You see that? W2 times x. That makes the model not linear. Okay? That means you have to linearize the model. Okay? So in one felt swoop, I took this thing, I found a steady state, which is easy to find. I linearized it, I rearranged and got this transfer function. Okay? Since we've done this now, I think, I don't know, Five times, eight times, I don't know the exact number. I'm just telling you that's what you get. Okay. If you don't know how to get from here to here, obviously you may not see that this yields this. You would have to actually do it. But if you don't have any idea how I got from there to there, you, you should do this. Okay. You should do it anyway, because that's the kind of thing that's on the test. But all right. So this is this is my um, linearized differential equation, right? It involves the output, it involves the two inputs. Now what do I do? Now I'm going to take the Laplace transform of this guy, right? It's in deviation variables. That makes it convenient because when I take the Laplace transform of the left-hand side, the initial condition will be zero like always. All right. I'm going to take the Laplace transform. I get an S term here times X prime of S. I'll get a term over there. I'll bring it over. I'll gather. I'll divide. And I'll get this. Okay. Again, this is all algebra. It's if you've done this enough, you can see immediately how I'd go from here to here. Again, it's not, it's not critical that you like, can do all this in your head and you see this is the exact expression. It is a problem if you don't know how I, would, like, how I possibly got from here to here. Okay, it's the same thing. Take Laplace transform, rearrange. If you do, you'll get this. Okay. So we always like to rearrange it like this, right? There's the output is on the left-hand side, and the input or inputs are on the right-hand side. So these are two transfer functions, OK? This is a transfer function that represents how the disturbance x1 affects the composition coming out. And this is the transfer function that tells you how the flow rate of the other stream that we're going to manipulate eventually affects the composition coming out, OK? So again, this might be a good exercise. Take this equation, linearize it to get this, take Laplace transform to get that. But it's, it's nothing different than what we've done before. All right, and because this is unwieldy, I prefer to write this as you know, first order transfer functions with a k and a tau. They both have the same tau. Tau has some physical significance, right? This thing here is the mass. This is the mass flow rate. So this is the residence time tau. Okay, so it has some meaning. Um, and that's what I call k1, and that thing is what I call k2. So just shorthand notation, write it like this. Okay. So that's, the, that's written algebraically in terms of Laplace, uh, in terms of Laplace transforms and transfer functions. This is equivalent representation in terms of a block diagram. What does this say? It says x1, x prime 1 to be more precise, 
goes through this transfer function that represents this term right here, or that term right there, same thing. W2 goes through this transfer function, that's this part. I add the two things together, and the result is x. It's just a block diagram representation of this algebraic equation. It's convenient, so that's why we use it. Okay? All right. So again, if you look at this, this says this, how, this is how the disturbance input and the manipulated input um, affect the output of interest. So that's, that's, the, that's the model. This is the model part. That's the process model. Okay? That's what we, so in this case, we have two transfer functions. So you might want to call this one, I don't know, G1 and G2, whatever. Okay? But these, these come from just the process. There's no control so far in any of this. Okay? The control comes next on this slide. All right, so w I'm just marching around this diagram. So I've got the process, and I notice the first thing I've got to do is measure the composition. So I want a transfer function that represents the dynamics of the analyzer. We talked about this, I guess, the end of last week. The simplest thing you can do um, for any analyzer or final control element like a control valve is just assume it's a first-order system okay, with some gain and some time constant. So this is my model. I'm not deriving this, I'm just stating it, okay? That this is what I'm going to choose to be my model of my sensor. The actual mass fraction is going into this thing and coming out as my measurement of the mass fraction in some units like milliamps, okay? The gain is the conversion of the mass fraction to milliamps and the tau is how fast this sensor responds. Typically, this tau m is going to be really small. And I told you last time, usually we could just ignore this tau m and just call it km, but for now, we'll assume it has some dynamics associated with it. Okay. All right, so that's my model of the sensor right there. Not derived from fundamental principles, just stated as a reasonable thing. All right. All right, now I've got this control part, right? I've got this controller. So what does the controller do? What I've depicted here is assume it's a PI controller. All right, so what does the controller do? Well, it takes the measurement, sorry, takes the set point, compares that to the measurement, generates an error signal, goes through this transfer. You might recall this is the transfer function we derive for a PI controller. It's the G, I call it GC of S. Okay. So what we're doing here, generate the error signal by subtracting. That's what this does, right? It takes this signal, subtracts it from this signal, which gives me the error signal. I operate upon this with the PI control algorithm, which is represented here in terms of a transfer function we derived. And then I get an output of the controller. Okay. Now, the measurement that's available to me is in milliamps, right? Because that's what this thing provides. It provides a measurement, let's say, in milliamps. That means the set point has to be in milliamps, right? Because you can't compare a set point in units of mass fraction to, to a measurement in milliamps. So I have to convert my set point into the right units. That's what this KM does. Right? This KM, if we look up here, is it converts things that are, have units of mass fraction to things that have units of milliamps. It's like the calibration curve of the sensor. Okay, just a line with a slope. And so this KM will convert the set point that I specify in terms of mass fraction into a set point in milliamps so I can subtract this from it. Okay? Then I get the output of the controller. All right, so what does the output of the controller do? Well, the controller sends its signal to this I to P converter, right? This is something that converts a signal from milliamps to, to pressure to actually drive the valve. So there's some gain associated with it. Okay? In fact, this signal, I think, is, is usually 4 to 20 milliamps, and this is 3 to 15 PSI. So if you took, you know, 15 minus 3 and divided by 20 minus 4, that's the gain of this thing. Okay? Just a calibration. All right. Because we assume this thing is really, you typically would have no uh, discernible dynamics, so they'd be very fast. We just neglect them. Okay. So to go over this again, so this is the model of the analyzer. This is the model of the controller, and this is the model of that I to P converter. And then finally, um, we have the model of the valve, right? Because that's the last thing. The, the IDP converter sends a signal to the valve, and the valve actually changes the flow. So this is the signal being sent from the, from the valve, and this is the actual flow being established by the valve. We'll assume the dynamics of the valve are, again, first order. There's some gain. That's the gain that converts PSI to actual flow, which is assumed to be um, kilograms per minute. And this is the time constant of the valve. should be small but we include it in there for now. Whoops, sorry about that. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put all these little pieces together into what 
I like to call the mother of all block diagrams. All right. And the mother is going to get bigger as the class proceeds. So this is the current mother of all block diagrams. And it's just those, all those little pieces together. So just marching you through this, over here is the process part, right? It said, here's how the, the disturbance, x1, and the manipulated input affect the composition coming out in terms of mass fraction. That's the first thing I derived. That's the process part, OK? All right. Now, this um, composition here, mass fraction, has to be measured. We assume that we had a measurement device that had no dynamics. It produces a measurement in milliamps. You take that signal in milliamps, subtract it from the set point in milliamps to get an error in milliamps. You get the set point in milliamps by putting it through this gain. All I'm doing is putting all those pieces, connecting them all together. There's nothing new in this diagram except they're all connected. Controller takes the error signal, operates on it with this algorithm, which is a PI algorithm, okay? has a gain and an integral component, generates a signal. That signal is in milliamps. It gets sent through this IDP converter, which creates a pressure signal that actually drives the valve. That's the dynamics of the valve, and the valve actually establishes the flow. Okay? So disturbance transfer function, pro, uh, you know, we usually call this the process transfer function. It's associated with the manipulated input. So process, disturbance, sensor, controller, IDP converter, valve. Okay. OK, so this is, this is a closed loop block diagram. It tells me how two things affect the output. One is the set point, right? Over here is the set point. I choose this. This is what I want the composition to be. And through the, something that looks quite complex, right, it eventually has some effect, obviously, on the, on the composition coming out. What I want the controller to do is to make that thing equal to this, right? Because I specify what this is in mass fraction. This is a deviation variable, right? So if, if the nominal mass fraction was 1 half, the signal might be 0, just meaning it's, I want it to be the nominal value. But whatever, I'll specify what this mass fraction should be. And then the job of this controller is to try to make this composition equal to the desired value. Okay? There's another input here, which is the disturbance. The disturbance is something I wish weren't here, but is here anyway. So if this inlet stream that I have no control over co comes to me and the composition of that feed changes, right? that stream composition changes, that's going to tend to cause the composition coming out to change. Right, so you imagine I'm operating at a nice steady state, and this composition is equal to the set point just like I want. And then less A comes in the stream, so this x1 goes down. Well, eventually, through the dynamics represented in this block here, the composition coming out will go down. And then the controller has to increase the w2 to drive the A back. So the idea is. You want x to follow this. We call that tracking. And we want the controller to eliminate the effect of x1 as much as possible. We call that disturbance rejection. All right? So this is fairly complex looking. Um, it won't be long until we simplify this diagram quite a bit. Because if you're in a real plant, OK, let's say, what do you do in a real plant? The controller sends a signal. And it's not easy for you to identify these different components. Like, what's the dynamics of this, or what's the gain of this versus dynamics of the valve and the process? So we tend to lump all this stuff together and just call it the process, you'll, as we'll do later, because it just is easier to do that way. But for now, we'll keep it like this um, for simplicity. But eventually, we'll have just a controller, just one transfer function for the process, one for the disturbance. That'll pretty much be it, because all these other things, that, 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 will all be lumped in with this. We won't worry about that now. OK, so this is a closed loop block diagram. It looks kind of unwieldy. You can see that you don't want to have this on the test, right? Because you don't know what I'm talking about right? at this point. But you'll become more familiar with it and more comfortable with it as you see it um, throughout the course. All right, so this diagram is nice. It's for the specific example I just went through. What I'm going to do on the next slide is just generalize this, block, this diagram to look like this. Okay. So we're calling all these things that have dynamics Gs, transfer functions. We have to give them a different subscript depending on what G we're talking about. GP means the process transfer function, how the manipulated input affects the output of interest. GD is how the disturbance input that we don't like affects the output. GM is the sensor. GC is the controller. GV is the final control element, typically a valve, so we call it GV. And this thing here never has dynamics. This is just a convert unit conversion. KM just converts units.
the physical units into units that you can compare to the measurement. So this is the generic block diagram. Okay? And this generic block diagram is what we're going to do with the analysis on. So my goal is going to be the following. I want to know how this output will respond if I change the set point, and I want to know how this output will respond if I change the disturbance. Okay? To do this, I'm going to drive transfer functions that relate the output to these two inputs. So this is the analog of what you guys did here, right? So far, you've done this problem. You get this transfer function. I tell you what the input change is. You know the G. You take the inverse Laplace transform. You find the Y of T, right? So the question now is, for example, let's say I want to do this. So I'd like to know what happens if I change the set point. I want to compute the response of the output, right? So I want to do this thing. I tell you what the set point is as a function of time. You take Laplace transform and get the set point as a function of Laplace variable. Set point would be like a step change. I want to change the, the value of the composition from 0.5 to 0.6, something like that, OK? And you know, if you could find y of s, you could just take the inverse Laplace transform in principle and find y of t. So this is looking a lot, this is looking very similar, right, to what we did up here. Same thing we did here. I give you a u of t, you take Laplace transform, you find u of s, you find the g of s by the process we've been through many times. And then once you get the y of s, you take the inverse Laplace transform and find the y of t. So I want to do the same thing here. I want to specify the set point instead of this input, and I want to compute the output's response to the set point. So it's nothing new. The, the problem is, what, what, what should that be? Like, what's that transfer function to do this? And the transfer function to do that is the closed, so-called closed loop transfer function, right? So this is the open loop. And I need something called the closed loop transfer function to do what I want. I have to, I have to derive it. I'm about to do that. That's, what I'm that's why I'm deriving it, because once I have it, then I can compute how the system responds to changes in either the disturbance or the set point. And the goal here, just so we're all on the same page, you don't lose the physical meaning to all this, I want the output to follow this thing, and I want the output to be insensitive to that thing, ideally. Okay? All right. So now we're going to launch off on doing this. So this is actually quite easy because this, these, this just represents a series of algebraic relations. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this block diagram, and I'm just going to write out the corresponding algebraic relations for them, rearrange them, and eventually get what I want. Okay. All right, so for example, you see y here? It says y is the sum of these two signals. I call this one yd, and I call this one yu, because this is the, the part of y that comes from the disturbance. This is the part of y that comes from u. So I just gave these same names. y equals the sum of those two. That's that right there. Okay. Now, for this first part, I'm only interested, so, th so the system is linear, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this in two pieces. I'm going to, first of all, find how the system responds to a set point change if there's no disturbance. That's this, what I'm doing right now. And the next part, I'm going to find out how the output responds to disturbance if there's no set point change. And because the system is linear, I can just add those two effects together. Once I have each effect alone, superposition applies, I can just add up the effects. Okay. So because I'm only interested in this point, if this changes, and not if this changes, and it's implicit in all this that these are deviation variables, even though I don't put primes because it's just unwieldy, something not changing is equivalent to it being 0, right? Because you know, d prime 